Are you a dark dreamer? Author, musician, and filmmaker John Skip most radically is. In 1983, Skip teamed up with Craig Spector and splatterpunked the world of horror for an entire decade. Skip and Spector's raw and cinematic style generated one novelization and several truly terrifying novels. The Light at the End, The Cleanup, The Screen, Deadlines, The Bridge, and finally, Animals. In 1993, the duel parted ways. Skip later became the lead singer in the local band, Mumbo's Brain. The new millennium saw the release of his most recent novel, The Emerald Burrito of Oz. Recently, John invited us to his abode in the hills above Los Angeles, where we discuss the wonderfully dark philosophy behind it all. Tell us about your current projects. I have made the transition from book writing to filmmaking, and that is primarily where I'm at right now. So, um, whereas my last book was uh, a kind of a, can I say fucked up? Yes. Okay. Uh, kind of a f- fucked up fantasy adventure. It was really fun and good natured. Uh, it's called The Emerald Burrito of Oz, and I wrote it with my friend Mark Leventhal. That. <sighs> That was the last novel I will probably write for several years. And um, I'm fine with that because film is pretty much where I'm going now. The, the fact of the matter is, music has always been a huge thing for me. Story has always been a huge thing for me. And film is the one place where I get to do music and story and run around with other people and uh, get to play. And uh, yeah, after years and years of being just a writer, I, I want a t shirt that says, Play as well with others. You know, I, I wanted to get out of the chair and out of the room and, and go uh, do some stuff I hadn't already done. So now I am working on film and uh, writing scripts for myself to direct, writing scripts for others. Tell us the Skip Inspector story. I was working in New York at this point as a painter, uh, painting this guy's, this photographer's uh, studio, a guy named Hank Londoner who shot naked women for Penthouse and had this beautiful model girlfriend who was from York, Pennsylvania. That's how all that happened. Took the day off. He was shooting something. He couldn't have me painting. Uh, So I go down to the little pizza place on the corner and get a slice of pizza and hear this radio uh, broadcast saying that um, 18 cabbies had been killed that year. Uh, in their cabs by, you know, fuckheads. And I got this story, went home and wrote it, and immediately sold it to Twilight Zone. It's called uh, The Long Ride. Then I wrote a couple more, and at that point, Craig from Boston calls me up and says, hey, I got this great idea for this this vampire story. Uh, how about if we write it and you sell it to Twilight Zone, we'll make a couple hundred bucks. And I said, okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, months went by, I was writing my own shit, he comes down, finally pesters me. He's like, we should really do this. So we sat down and we talked about it and realized that it was a book, that it was not a short story, that it was a whole book. And over the course of the next two years, working as messengers, wrote the thing, running around the street, got the logistics of New York down pat. Craig moved down and became a messenger as well. And um, this book was written. It was The Light at the End. And uh, a number of rejections later, it sold and turned into this hot little number. And um, at the point that that happened, um, you know, Bantam, who wound up buying it, Bantam Books, Lou Aronica says, um, do you have anything else? And so Craig and I sit down. I had a variety of books that I wanted to write, stories I wanted to tell, and we just laid out a five-year plan of books, music, films, uh, you know, an ancillary, you know, hilarity. So, walked in the next day, met Lou, laid out the whole thing. At a certain point, he just says, he picks up his phone and says, hold my calls for the rest of the day. And we had a deal. We went from, you know, uh, gravel sucking, uh, uh, you know, menials trudging around on the streets to having the sweet deal, three book deal. And so Craig and I became, uh, as we had been years before in bands, we became partners. But why are you tired of writing novels? Cause I did it. 
and having done it and finding it good, moved on. I mean, you know, that, that's really uh, the heart of it. And I mean, the Skip Inspector uh, thing that we did, um, you know, played out over about a 10 year stretch. And we produced a bunch of books that, uh, that were rewarding for, uh, personally and uh, professionally and, you know, left our little mark on the scene. But um, by the end of that run, a couple of things happened. Number one, uh, horror went into a recession from a publishing standpoint. And so we sort of felt like we were being kidnapped by Kmart, you know, to sort of mark down. And it was like, no, uh, you don't pour this much work into something and then not have it be valued the way you want it valued. For example, you were valued what? At one year you were valued this much and then... Well, yeah, I mean, uh, we had a couple of bestsellers, you know, New York Times bestsellers sold a million copies. That was swell. And then at a certain point, it was after deadlines. Um, deadlines came out and we had been asked to take the short story collection and make it play like a novel. And so we did, but then they marketed it like a short story collection and our numbers never quite came back to what they were. And, uh, and after a while, it's sort of like, whoa, my ass is really sore now. You know, uh, I, I feel like um, like I am not appreciated here. And, and so there was that. Uh, Craig and I completely parted ways uh, uh, in, in a not pretty manner. I, I think at a certain point, I know for me, I just realized, wow, uh, you know, he doesn't even really like me anymore. You know, so why, am, why are we doing this? You know, so it was time to go do something else. Um, we had moved to LA to do film and, you know, spent about a year in the studio dance doing what you do in the studio dance, which is meeting a bunch of people, having them tell you, you're the best writer I've ever met. And, uh, and I love what you've just done and, and I can't use it. Um, and, <laughs> and having, you know, like, uh, you know, half a million dollars dangled in front of you on a, on a fairly regular basis and then having it yanked. And uh, after about a year of that shit, um, I was done. And um, I personally went through a, a really kind of a nightmare. I, I snapped like a fucking twig, basically, is what happened. And, and uh, I sort of told people, you know, the last skip broke, so I killed him and ate him. And as soon as I grow a new one back, I'll let you know. Uh, and um, so I spent several years growing one back. And in the meantime, pursuing other disciplines that would make me happier. Music being a huge one, music totally saved my life. And uh, film, film as a much more gradual process because I didn't know how to do it. I knew I wanted to know how, um, but I had to learn. So um, coming off of that, no real desire to write fiction. Uh, Ed Kramer actually periodically would come into my life and say, would you write me a piece for this book? And I would go, sure. And those would be like the few pieces of fiction that I'd actually do. Uh, and this is how I met Mark Leventhal, who I did the burrito with. Um, Ed Kramer asked me if I would uh, do a story for Dark Delicacies uh, 2, not Dark Delicacies, uh, Dark, Dark... Dark uh, Love, Dark Destiny. Not the, dark Destiny, thank you very much. Um, and I didn't really have it in me. I just didn't really want to, but I had these ideas that might make a really cool story. I just didn't want to do them. Now, at the same time, um, the book that wind up that will wind up in a couple of months being released called Mondo Zombie, which is like the follow up to the Books of the Dead, was happening. And I had met this cool guy, musician named Mark Leventhal. Turned out he was a voracious reader and he was starting to write. Uh, I said, why don't you write me a zombie story? He wrote me one. It was fucking great. And I said, I really like this guy. So when Ed Kramer came to me with this story opportunity, I said, Mark, you're excited. I'm not. You want to play? And maybe your enthusiasm will rub off on me. And in fact, it did. And we wrote this piece called The Punchline, which I like very much. It's a novella in there. Um, but that was the beginnings also of my transition with regards to what I think the importance of horror is and uh, its function in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'm kind of circling back around. Uh, I just realized that part of what made me snap was that I took 
writing horror very, very personally. And, and if I were doing a traumatic scene, if it didn't traumatize me, it was not good enough. Um, and so I put myself through an awful lot of really, really heinous stuff emotionally uh, in order to do what I felt was good enough work to put out there. There's a philosopher named Alan Watts, who's one of my favorites, and, and uh, in talking about philosophers, he said, I could break the world of philosophers down into prickles and goo. Prickly philosophers and gooey philosophers. Prickly philosophers are very fact-intensive, not real emotional, and they like their things such. They despise gooey philosophers as worshiping some undifferentiated cosmic continuum where everything kind of slops together. Now, I think you can pretty much tell what kind of person you're talking to by what kind of films they like. Join me here again on the wild side of the imagination where a sense of wonder and a feeling of terror can often intersect. You'll find us waiting here, the Dark Dreamers. <laughs>